Muy buenas tardes, uh, good evening, welcome to the digital channel of Estisto Cervantes in Leeds and Manchester. It is a great honor to have you all as uh, our audience and uh, in this, which is with our third uh, lecture in the series Duende Global, Journeys of Flamenco, in which uh, Professor Carlos van Torengen will help us to understand and enjoy flamenco by deepening our knowledge of it. Flamenco, as you, most of you uh, might know, is an authentically global and, and art that began as popular music, music of the people, the tablaos, uh, and that has been gaining importance until it was declared uh, uh, from the UNESCO as um, her intangible heritage of humanity in 2010. In that way, uh, that was a wake-up call similar to the iconic 1922 uh, Concurso de Cantejondo de Granada, which was promoted by Manuel de Falla and García Lorca. And it was a reminder of the world that there is a gender that is very important, not only for the Spanish culture, but the culture and the music as, as a whole in the world. The flamenco represents a white complex, a multidimensional reality, and these differences in flamenco are extensive, including uh, where it takes place, uh, which makes the authenticity of it and the art even more complex. In order to better understand it, that is the aim of this uh, series, uh, we have to, today our uh, um, lecture on the International Flamenco Journeys. And today uh, it will be dedicated to uh, Asia a discussion of uh, Isaki La Cuesta film, La Leyenda del, Tem del Tiempo. It takes the name from the uh, 10th album of Cameron de la Isla, a very famous uh, flamenco singer. A figure at the center of the film, posthumously, our talk will center on La Cuesta's 2006 film, since the popularity of flamenco in Japan has exploded in the past century. Uh, La Cuesta explores the connection between Japanese and Spanish culture through the stories of a young gitano from San Fernando and a girl from Tokyo who travels to Spain in hope of learning El Cante. Isaki La Cuesta is a Spanish director, writer, and producer from Gerona, and he has won over 30 awards, including four for the film we will discuss today, La Leyenda del Tiempo, such as the winter, such as the winner story of the best Spanish film at the ACCEC Awards in 2007. He is also known for the other films such as Entre dos Aguas, La Proxima Piel, y Los Condenados. But before I give the floor to Carlos Antonio, I would also like to introduce him. Dr. Carlos Van Tongeren is a lecturer in the Spanish Cultural Studies at the University of Manchester. He's currently the principal investigator of the project Flamenco after Franco, new interdisciplinary approaches to performance of memory in post disasterial Spain, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Pedro Ordóñez Esclava from the University of Granada. His publication has been featured in journals such as the Journal of Spanish Cultural Studies and Studies in Spanish and Latin American Cinema. So once again, thank you very much for taking part in this fourth uh, event of uh, our series. And I remind you that if you have uh, uh, some questions, uh, you can put it uh, please in the in the chat. And at the end of the discussion, at the end of the of the lecture, uh, we will have 15 minutes for those uh, questions to be answered. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias a todos por estar aquí esta noche. Y le paso la palabra a Carlos Antonio Gracias. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Pedro. Uh, thanks very much for your kind introduction, as always, and for uh, offering this forum for discussion of some ideas about flamenco, um, its relations with film, its relations with um, other countries than Spain. And this is already the last seminar of the series. And I was just talking to Carlos Pulpillo. Um, about the fact that the first of this uh, seminar series took place in March and in, um, a couple of weeks back I saw on YouTube the recordings of the first three sessions and it seems that the series has or that this whole year 
our entire notion of time has changed so much. It seems to have gone so fast, this series. I can definitely tell that I personally have changed because I look differently on each uh, on each recording. Today, a change of scenery as well. I'm not in my in my home office. I'm uh, I'm uh, at work now. But um, yeah, it seems that if we're going to talk about um, contractions of time, it seems quite appropriate to do that with reference to a song by Camarón, La Leyenda del, precisely the legend of time, or La Leyenda del Tiempo, and the film that Isaki La Cuesta made uh, based on that on that very famous song and that very famous album by Camarón. Um, I'm aware that the film was screened last week, and I hope that most of you have been able to, to, to watch it. Um, if that is not the case, that is not necessarily a problem. Uh, in this um, seminar, I'll try to analyze the film with you. I'll try to, to give some ideas that you may want to use if you want to watch it in the future to, uh, to, be, you know, to pay attention to a couple of things that I think are interesting about this film. Um, but I also try, uh, I'm going to try to link this film to some of the wider concerns of this seminar series, Global Duende, the International Journeys of Flamenco. So I'd like to use the film as well as a uh, text that is going to help us reflect on a couple of the wider issues that I've tried to, uh, that we've tried to cover in this seminar series. So at the end of the seminar, also uh, draw the entire series to a conclusion by saying what I think that we can take away from Is Isaki's, Isaki La Cuesta's beautiful, beautiful, uh, beautiful movie. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to share my screen with you. As Pedro has indicated, the official title of today's uh, seminar is Asia, or it's dedicated to Asia, which is, of course, a little bit of a pretentious or bombastic title because I'm not going to be able, nor am I going to pretend to talk about the entire Asian continent and its relations with flamenco. That would be a very complex and long discussion. Um, but I'm going to try and focus on a couple of things that I think are interesting and relevant for this particular film. So I'll start with a very quick recap of the first three seminars that we had in previous months, in case you haven't been able to, uh, to attend. Uh, the recordings are all on YouTube, so if you're interested in watching any of those recordings later, uh, feel free to, uh, to just go on YouTube, and if you search for Global Duende, you should be able to find them. Then I'll say something in very general terms about flamenco in Asia, and more in particular about flamenco in Japan, which is the Asian country that has the strongest connection with flamenco, where flamenco has gained massive popularity uh, to such extent that now if you go to uh, uh, Andalusia or other parts of Spain to practice flamenco, if you take flamenco dance or singing or guitar lessons, you will always meet people from Japan, from China, from, from other countries, and some of them uh, may be living in Spain, uh, many of them are very skillful as well, very dedicated to flamenco. So this seems to be a, a continent where flamenco has indeed gained very uh, widespread popularity. Um, after those more general statements, I'll move on to the analysis of the film itself. Um, and I'm going to use that analysis to draw a couple of conclusions also about this concept of global duende uh, and what it means exactly to talk about flamenco and to talk about duende from a global perspective. So in previous seminars, there have been three before this one. Uh, basically, what we did, if you look at the image in the upper right-hand corner, we've been following the triangle uh, that also reflects, obviously, Spain's involvement in the transatlantic slave trade during the colonial era. We started in the first seminar with uh, the connections between Spain and Northern Africa uh, during the times of Al-Andalus, and also the connections between Spain, flamenco, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is a topic that until very recently was not really, has not really been covered in scholarship or in art, uh, artistic performances of flamenco, but is definitely a very important and interesting new subfield of flamenco studies, the ways in which um, slaves or freed slaves that were taken from Africa to um, the Americas and then some of them taken back to Spain and to other parts of Europe, the influences that their musical traditions have had on the development of flamenco. So those topics were covered in the first seminar. And in the second one, we moved on to Latin America to, uh, uh, to uh, have a look at this second, uh, the second connection in, the, in, this, in this triangle. 
Uh, we looked at the crossover connections and the development of a couple of key flamenco styles, such as the fandangos, uh, and the ways in which uh, the um, American continent or the Americas have contributed to the development of those styles. Then the last seminar, um, we moved back to Europe, the last seminar in October, uh, and we also made a journey across time. So there we spoke about um, the second half of the 20th century and the ways in which artists that migrated from Spain or that were exiled from Spain during the Franco dictatorship contributed to uh, the uh, circulation of flamenco across national borders and also how they helped establish new uh, circles and new, new uh, networks of solidarity, of cultural uh, exchange, but also of political solidarity between people that were opposing um, dictatorial regimes on different sides of the Atlantic. So those were the three the three seminars that we covered in uh, the three continents or the three areas, the cultural areas that we, we covered in the preceding seminars. Now, today's continent is not present on this uh, map of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and this is a continent that perhaps is often not really part or under radar of people when we talk about flamenco and other musical traditions uh, from, from Europe. And there are certain reasons for that, I think, that have definitely to do with the history of, the, of colonialism and imperialism, the fact that Asia for a long time was considered as an exotic other of the Western world, as a, a, a part of the world that the West didn't really have strong connections with or didn't really know how to deal with. Uh, and I think that is also true for flamenco, the history of flamenco, where Asia is perhaps only the only recently um, has started being on the radar and is now also, I think, uh, a topic of, of interest, of scholarship. Uh, there are some journalists in Spain that have started writing book, books about the ways in which flamenco has become popular in Asia and also how Asian artists from Japan, from China and other other parts of Asia have, have moved to Spain to contribute to the development of flamenco. And this is only something, so in chronological terms, we're continuing here with the previous seminar in which we focused on the 1960s and 70s. I think flamenco in Asia is a phenomenon that uh, starts in that period as well, the 1960s or the 1970s. Now, as I said, flamenco and Asia, I'm not going to pretend to cover its connections uh, with the whole continent. So what I'm going to have to leave out of this seminar, for example, is the relations between flamenco and India uh, and the musical heritage of India, which, of course, is a very interesting and complex topic in itself because the uh, complex theories about the origins of gitanos and their diasporic movements from different continents towards Europe and then towards Spain has a lot to do with India, right? Um, one of the most accepted theories about the origins of gitanos is that they are uh, the uh, that their ancestors were members of a pariah caste in india that left uh, started leaving india between the 10th and the 15th century and then slowly moved into europe and ultimately arrived at spain as well uh, in the 15th century approximately and there are if you search for examples on youtube or other platforms there are many, many contemporary artists from India, but also from Spain, that have tried to emphasize that shared musical and cultural heritage of the Gitanos in Spain and uh, Indian musicians or the Indian uh, musical heritage. Artists such as uh, the guitarist from Granada, Pepe Abichuela, who released an album called Yerba Buena, in which he collaborated with the Bollywood, the Bollywood Strings Orchestra, uh, there are recordings and collaborations as well of the daughter of Ravi Shankar, Anushka Shankar, who has collaborated with Ricardo Migno uh, and other artists from southern Spain. And there are multiple uh, initiatives where these artists try uh, emphatically to emphasize, uh, to emphatically to, 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 to explore and to, 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 to uh, indicate how much in common the Gitanos in Spain have with, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, the musical traditions from, from India. So that is a, a very interesting and complex topic in itself that I'm not going to be able to, to go into in detail today. 
Um, rather than focusing on India as an entire continent, I'd like to focus on Japan, which, as I said, is the country where flamenco appears to be very popular and perhaps the most popular uh, in comparison with uh, uh, other, other countries in, in Asia. And I'm drawing here on some recent publications. Uh, for example, this book that was released only, uh, only a year ago by uh, David Lopez Canales, which explores the, uh, the, the, the flamenco scene in Japan. And it works with oral history and with interviews with Spanish artists, but also Japanese artists, and the ways in which they have started getting involved in the flamenco scene, both in Japan and, uh, and in Spain. And all of this has to do with the, uh, the economic, but also the politi uh, political climate of the 1960s. Um, after the Second World War in the 1960s, uh, Japan entered a phase of economic progress, of economic redevelopment. Uh, so the country was booming and could therefore attract uh, people from other countries, musicians, to start performing, to start con contributing to rebuilding not only the economy of Japan, but also its cultural infrastructure. Coincidentally, in Spain in the 1960s, as we saw in the preceding seminar, um, that was also a time of economic progress. The second half of the dictatorship, which where the country opened itself uh, uh, for foreign influences, foreign visitors, a booming tourism industry, and other forms of economic development. At the same time, this is a, a, a decade in which many uh, members, uh, many, many artists, artists and communities from the poor regions in the south of Spain had to find uh, a way to make a living elsewhere. And that is why many flamenco artists in particular decided to go to Japan, where only recently a new flamenco tablao had opened in Tokyo, a tablao which is called El Flamenco. And the first artists started performing there in the early 1960s. Artists like Pepe Avichuela and his wife, uh, the dancer Antonio Gades, the dancer Cristina Hoyos, uh, Paco de Lucia, and other artists that started performing there. And some of them even stayed there for a year or for longer and performed there very regular, uh, regularly in these uh, tablaos that had started to open in Tokyo and other places. So the context in which flamenco arrives at Japan and becomes popular in Japan is that of uh, economic progress and economic uh, development of the 1960s. Now, I think that for flamenco, we don't yet have that man many sources about this exact, the exact details of this process and also wider reflections about the meaningfulness of this process and why exactly it may be that flamenco became so popular in Japan, which is a question that many of us may be asking ourselves. Why is it precisely Japan where flamenco has become so popular and where it is practiced uh, by many skillful artists on such a widespread level. And here I'd like to refer to a study about Argentinian tango, uh, a very insightful uh, study by Marta Savigliano, in which she, she asks a series of questions about the interest for Argentinian tango in Japan, which started a bit earlier at the, the early decades of the 20th century. But I think some of the questions that she asks, we can apply those to flamenco as well. So for example, uh, when describing this process, the arrival of tango uh, uh, at Japan and the fact that it became so popular there, uh, according to Savigliano, for many Argentinians, they were quite puzzled by that. They didn't really understand why all of a sudden tango became so popular in Japan. So she asked, why are Argentina, uh, Ar Argentinos more puzzled by tango's popularity in Japan than they are by the tango rage in uh, Western cities like Paris or New York. So apparently there's something about Japan that makes it quite, uh, quite puzzling for some, or that makes it quite fascinating that uh, these musical styles like tango and flamenco can become so popular there. And I think this is a very good question that we can apply to flamenco as well. Why should we be so amazed by the fact that flamenco is more popular in Japan then we should be by the fact that it's also popular in the UK or the Netherlands or the United States and other countries that are traditionally part of the West.